as you all probably know, I work with Dr. Kelly Jershley, so our practice is a urogynecology. Um, and I'm here to talk about post-operative urinary retention and how we manage it in our office. A few years ago, we had some feedback from our patients letting us know that we really weren't doing a great job of preparing them for the possibility of going home with a catheter. So at that point, we really thought we needed to improve our process, and that's kind of how I got really interested in this. So here are some learning objectives I have for the talk today. We want to define poor, identify the signs and symptoms of poor, potential damage, discuss some of the possible causes, um, discuss some preoperative teaching to our patients regarding poor, um, discuss patients at risk, describe avoiding trial procedure and how we do it in our office, um, and then describe failed voiding trials and intermittent self-catheterization. Um, Post-operative urinary retention poor. Even though there's no real standard definition of it, it can be defined as impaired bladder emptying with an elevated PVR. The key here to poor is early identification to protect the bladder and the kidneys. And the length, the time that the patient is in, in retention can affect um, the, the extent of the bladder damage. So we really want to try to resolve um, that quickly. So incidence of poor. Um, general surgical population is 4 to 13 percent. Um, after pelvic surgery, that rate can go anywhere from 2.5 to 43 um, percent. All of our surgeries, you know, most of them are done vaginally, so our patients are, are at a much higher risk of poor. Um, Dr. Jersley usually tells patients that um, approximately 40 percent of them are going to go home with a catheter. So it does involve a lot of our patients. Um, signs and symptoms of poor, it's pretty general nursing here. Um, urinary hesitancy, they have a difficult, difficulty starting their stream. It may be, the stream may be slow, it may be weak, it, they may have a spring, stream that sprays. Um, they can have suprapubic pain or pressure. Um, most of them ha do have a feeling of incomplete, incomplete bladder emptying, especially as that bladder starts to fill up. They become very anxious. Um, they can have a change in their blood pressure, and um, you can have bladder distension on palpation. Um, potential damage of poor. It can be urinary tract infections. Obviously, we all think of potty. Um, bladder distension and damage to the detursor muscle. If the bladder is stretched too much or for too long, the muscles may be permanently damaged and lose their ability to contract. The more distended the bladder is, the more difficult it will be for the patient to empty their bladder. And um, we usually say that if we get a post, uh, PBR of above 750, there's going to be trauma to that bladder. It needs to rest for five to seven days. In our office, resting is a Foley to gravity for, again, those five to seven days. Um, trauma to the bladder can lead to a neurogenic bladder. So again, um, quick resolution is a key. Um, and some risk factors associated with poor. Um, first one, anesthesia. It can stay in the body 24 to 72 hours. Um, regional or spinal anesthesia seems to be worse for poor. Um, and I always tell patients my story. All the nurses that I work with know my story. Um, I had a partial thyroidectomy a couple years ago. Um, I was in the hospital, you know, of course had my IV, had a drain in my neck, had to stay overnight. So as the evening went on, I was, um, again, going to the bathroom more and more, less and less was coming out. I was becoming more and more anxious, so by about uh, 3 or 4 in the morning, I was crazy. Of course, they cathed me, and I had a PBR of somewhere of 1,000. So I had to cath myself for about two weeks after surgery, and um, in my case, they think it was the anesthesia that affected my bladder. So um, you know, I tell people, it doesn't always have to be with the pelvic surgery. So um, again, kind of my story there. Um, cases lasting more than two hours, um, a 
if they have any post-operative opioids, which most of the patients do, it usually increases bladder capacity and decreases the, the, the tercer contractibility. So again, as that bladder gets full, it's not able to contract and push that urine out. Um, have they had a, a history of any um, bladder dysfunction, bladder outlet obstruction? Have they had prolapse? Have they had retention in the past? Um, I'm that prime example. Um, were they, did they have advanced prolapse where they went into retention? Um, IV fluid administration over 750 mLs. It can inhibit detersor function. Um, age. If they're 50 years or older, they have a two and a half um, higher pour rate. Um, if they've had severe fecal impaction, um, it puts a lot of pressure on the trigone. So have those patients had a history of um, you know, chronic constipation? Have they had to be um, you know, disimpacted in, in the past? So kind of look at that history. Have they had any um, pre-existing neurological condition? Um, you know, have they had spinal stenosis? Have they had a stroke? Are those your MS patients? Are the Parkinson's patients? Um, also, pa failure of the pelvic floor to relax. We all know, after both talks, how important the pelvic floor is here. Um, have they had pelvic floor PT? Did they have, you know, any pelvic pain? Did they have any trigger points? Um, you want to look at that, that urodynamics, that preoperative urodynamics. Um, did they have delayed sensations? What did that EMG look like? Was it reactive, non-reactive? Were they able to relax during the void? Um, so a lot of our patients can have multiple factors here, and all these can affect their emptying. Okay, so how do we do? How do we manage it in our office? Again, we're urogynecology. A urology office is probably going to handle it a little bit differently, um, and everybody's got their own process. Um, so, preparing for the voiding trial. How can we make it a success for the patient? Um, they usually are instructed that if they go home with a catheter, to call our office. But we also try to touch base with them first, or maybe Dr. Jersley will say, hey, you know, I released Susie Smith, she went home with a catheter, will you give her a call? So again, we want to touch base with those patients. We want to ask them, like Dr. Jersley said, bowels, bowels, bowels. Are they having bowel movements? How's their pain level? What are they taking for pain? Um, we're trying to get away from the Norco um, and the opioid you know, epidemic now, but we like them to be able to alternate a pain medication every three hours, like their ibuprofen, their Norco, so that um, they can stay on top of that pain. Um, again, we want to stress bowel activity. Again, like Dr. Jersley said, we usually recommend that they have Benefiber and Miralax. Also, to have some milk and magnesia on hand when they get home. Um, if they have problems, if those three things are not helping and they're not having bowel movements, then we want them to give us a call, let us know how they're doing. Um, but one of our doctors likes a half a bottle of citrate of mag to get things going. The other one likes a glycerin suppository. So those are some other things that we add. Again, with those patients, we want to you know, answer any questions they have. They're going to be really, really nervous. They all think that they're not the ones that we're going to go home with the catheter. Um, offer support. Um, so how do we do them in our office? They're usually done three to seven days after the surgical repair. If you talk to us nurses, we want to wait five to seven days. Again, we want the swelling to go down, we want their pain to be manageable, and we want them to be having normal bowel movements. Um, sometimes some of the doctors will tell the patient, oh, you can come back in two or three days, and they're usually not ready. <laughs> um, so again, we want to touch base with that patient. Before they come in, we want to see if we can re review the surgical procedure. What exactly did they have done? They've had an apical repair or a mid-urethral sling. They, they usually have a higher incidence of pore. Um, did they have a posterior repair? Um, they have a lot of sutures on that back wall. If they're really constipated, they're going to be really uncomfortable. Um, we want to try to review the voiding trial in the hospital if you have access to it. Um, you know, were they able to go at all? Did they just almost pass? Um, Usually we schedule the voiding trials between 8 and 9 in the morning. We want to have all day to be able to assess that patient. So if they do have problems, if they're not able to urinate, um, then they have time to come back to our office. Um, we really don't want them to go to the emergency room. 
so we'd rather have them come back to us. Um, basic supplies here that we use, um, 10 ml syringe, a 60 ml Tumi, like the plastic you know, beaker, a hat for the toilet to measure, non-sterile gloves, bladder scanner, or if you don't have a bladder scanner, just a catheter, um, catheter plug some, some of us use. The last thing I forgot was sterile water or saline, whatever you use. Just real basic supplies there. So our procedure is pretty basic. Um, we want to make sure that all the urine is drained from the bag. Um, and we're going to retrograde fill them using a Tumi syringe. Uh, we like to fill them to about 300 mLs. We want them to have a good strong urge to go, but we don't want to overfill their bladder. So we're going to deflate the balloon, remove the catheter, walk them to the bathroom, make sure that they're comfortable, allow privacy. We have a little bell that we keep in the bathroom for our patients um, that they can ring you know, when they're done voiding, um, if they feel dizzy, if they have any questions. And then it just it, it puts a little bit more control back in their lap. We're not always like, are you done? You know, are you done? Did you go? Um, so we like the bell. Um, and then we like to assess that PBR within about 10 to 15 minutes of them completing the void. Um, let's say they drank a big cup of coffee on the way to your office. And if you let them walk around for 30 to 40 minutes, that residual is not going to be accurate. They're, like I said, those kidneys are always going to be working and processing urine. So we want to try to assess that pretty quick after they're done. Okay. Assessing the outcome, uh, can be def uh, we consider a passing if they void two-thirds of the instilled volume. So if I put 300 in, I want them to go 200. I may let them pass at 190. Um, if they fail their voiding trial again, less than about 180, um, our choice is intermittent self-catheterization, which is really our first choice. Our second choice would be put that Foley back in but we don't want it hanging to gravity anymore. We use a, a flip flow in the office. I don't know if, if anybody else uses these. Um, I learned about these in the SUNA conference in, in um, October. So they're really, really nice. So it's, it's, it's really easy for the patient when they have the catheter back in, they can just empty it themselves and then it remains a, a sterile closed system. So we really like these. Um, if they do, Go home with this catheter. Usually we have them come back about five days after that. Um, we tell them they can use a leg bag at night if they want to, so they don't have to get up, so they can hopefully get a better night's sleep. Um, both ways lead to a, a, a quicker resolution of poor. Again, with the intermittent catheterization, with the um, Foley, with the flip flow, that bladder is going to get used to being filled and emptied. So hopefully it's going to start working a lot quicker. Um, of course, our last choice is to just put the Foley back in to gravity. Um, a couple things you have to keep in mind with all three of these is the, is the patient. Um, could they, could they self-cath? Are they an 80-year-old woman that's arthritic? Or are they a 40-year-old that had just a mid-urethral sling? She'd be easy to teach. Um, do they have the mental, like I said, de dexterity? Um, have they had a stroke? Um, if you put that Foley in with the flip flow, are they going to have someone there to, to either remind them to empty the bladder or um, are they going to forget? Maybe they're in a nursing home or something and what if that aide forgets to empty the bladder? So these are all things you have to take into consideration when you decide um, which one to put back in. Okay. This is just a little... Um, uh, I guess instructions that we give for our patients. It's part of their after visit summary when when they leave, um, once they've passed their voiding trial. Um, so I'll just quickly read it here, um, and then we put you have passed your voiding trial at let's say 9 a.m. Make sure you're drinking some water, that you're taking your Motrin to help reduce any swelling from the catheter. It's important to try to empty your bladder every two hours during the day. Try and empty again at 11 a.m., which would be, again, two hours after. If you're unable to empty, try and drink a glass of water. 
and then try again 30 to 60 minutes later. If you have been unable to empty your bladder by, at this point it'll be 1 p.m., which is four hours after leaving the office, you will most likely be uncomfortable and will need to come back into the office. So then we provide, obviously, their contact information. Again, we don't want them to go to the ER. So something like this hopefully helps. Um, considerations with the voiding trial. Um, all of our front desk, desk staff is really good about um, talking to the patient who calls that say, I have a catheter, I need to make an appointment for avoiding trial. Um, they're going to ask them two things. How's your pain level and how's your bowels? If there's any question with either one of those two, they're going to come back to the nurse triage line. Um, so again, constipation, like Dr. Jersley says, constipation, constipation, constipation. We want to assess those bowels, their pain level. Um, if they have a history of DO, that voiding trial is going to be a challenge. And you've got the tube in and you're putting water in, and they're going to have a contraction, and that water is going to go up and down the tube. So you're most likely not going to be able to get 300 in. You may not even get 100 in. They may leak on the way to the bathroom. So with those people, you're just going to have to rely on that, um, that residual volume to see what that is. UTIs can be a direct complication of poor. Uh, they're not going to pass avoiding trial if they have a UTI. So um, just, you know, assess the patient. If she feels like she has one, maybe talk to your doc, see if you can get it started, started on an antibiotic. Maybe put off that voiding trial for a couple days, have her come back in. Um, early versus late poor can uh, begin if they're taking too many of the narcotics. Infrequent voids, again, they can lead to increased bladder volume, maybe... They're that 40-year-old that they get home and they're busy with their kids again and they, they forget to go. Um, when we have the catheter in, we tell them to drink a lot. But now maybe they're still drinking a lot more over a short period of time and they're going to go into retention. Um, increasing constipation. Maybe when that catheter was in, they were really good about taking their Benefiber and their Miralax. Once the catheter was out, they said, no, you know, I can kind of relax. I don't need to take so much. And maybe they back down and boom, they're in constipation. So just um, things to keep in mind. Okay. Tips and tricks, pretty basic here. Um, you can turn on the water, see if that'll help. Um, usually we tell them if they have trouble, maybe sit in, in a bathtub with warm water. Just let them pee in there. Um, run warm water over the perineum. I read this. I'm not sure if it works. Um, peppermint oil, a couple drops in the toilet. Or if you put a couple drops just on a cotton ball and the patient sniffs it, I read that it may help. I don't know. Um, allow privacy, you know, time for them to go. Um, try having them double void. Um, have them sit on the toilet, urinate as best they can. Try to relax that pelvic floor. Um, and if they feel like they need to, pull their pants up, maybe walk around for just a minute. It's kind of going to trick the bladder and then have them go sit back down, and usually they can get a little bit more out. And again, like Karen said, maybe some of those relaxation techniques, deep breathing. Um, and then the intermittent self-catheterization. It's the per preferred method, best practice. Um, you can monitor the, monitor the PVR very well with that. Um, once the patients know how to do it, usually, usually they're pretty happy with it. They're not having a bag or even a catheter hanging around. They can run to the store. Um, you know, they have friends over. They're not worried about anything. Um, again, think of UTIs, biofilms. I have one slide coming up to show you those. Um, again, self-catheterization can lead to a faster resolution of pore. So if we can get that bladder working a lot quicker on its own, that's the key. I mean, if they do self-cath, usually we tell them that we want, we want to, them to keep tra track of their voided volumes and their residuals. And then usually we'll have them check in with us maybe two or three days after they've been cathing. If their PBRs are consistently over 100, they can stop. We do like the voided volumes to be 200 or more. Um, but... If their PBRs are over 500, then they need to cath more often. We need to protect the kidneys. Usually we recommend that they, that they cath four to six times a day. Again, it's going to depend on, on what they drink. Um, lastly, we have a company that we work with 
that will arrange supplies for the patients. They give us sample bags that's got written information, probably all of you do. Um, a mirror, usually they have catheters for like maybe two days, some lube, so that when that patient leaves, they have their own, um, their own stock, their own supply. And then we can contact the company and then they, they will verify the insurance, they mail everything right to the patient. The patient doesn't have to worry about running around town trying to find supplies. Um, and then it's obviously so much easier on us. And it also um, helps not de deplete our stock. I don't know if uh, you're all probably like you know, us in our office. You know, oh, here, take a couple extra catheters home. You know, here, oh, take some tape home. And then, you know, everybody's worried about cost these days. So hope that usually helps. Okay, these, um, I love these slides, the one on the left there, it's, um, it just really, to me, hits home about why you don't want that catheter in place. Um, those are biofilms, crystallization on the catheters. The biofilms start to form after just the catheter being in one day, and that ba bacteria can ascend up into the bladder anywhere from one to three days. So. It's really, really important to um, not have that catheter in, if we can help it at all. Um, the one on the right is what I've, we've started using for some patient education when we try to talk to them about self-cath, um, maybe convince them to learn how to self-cath. Um, it's a real good picture to show how those biofilms can work their way up, up the catheter into the bladder. Screening, possible anticipation of poor. Um, as part of our like, patient improvement process, again, we realized that we weren't educating our patients about the possibility of going home with the catheter. We needed to do, to do a better job. So we changed our urodynamic slot times to increase them by about 10 to 15 minutes. So we had more time to talk to the patient about their bowels, about their post-operative restrictions, um, about going home with the catheter. And these are all in written, and we, then it's part of their ABS. Um, and then they, some, we've even had, you know, get the Foley out, show them what it looks like, show them what the bag looks like. So um, they're more prepared for that possibility. Um, and all of our surgicals have um, your dynamics before. Um, so again, we feel like we have a captive audience at that point. Um, identify high-risk patients. Pretty much in our office, I would like to say almost all of them are. Again, you know, the, the stroke, the Parkinson's, do they have a neurogenic bladder, do they have incomplete emptying, have they have recurrent UTIs? Um, so just look at all that, I guess. Um, assess the preoperative urodynamics. Um, what are that, again, what did that EMG look like? What did their pelvic floor do when they were voiding? Were they able to relax? Um, were they doing any valsalva voiding? Were they pushing to have to get the urine out? Were their peak flow rates and their dertusia pressures, pressures low? Um, did they have high post void residuals on urodynamics even after reduction? Um, usually we consider a high post void residual 150 or more. That's kind of, I think everybody's maybe got a different one, but that's what we use. Um, did they have delayed sensations? Um, and um, so, you know, do these patients that maybe after surgery need some? Um, relaxation techniques. Maybe we need to send them back to PT. Um, that resolution sometimes takes a little while. Um, and lastly, these patients are all frustrated. Like I said, they think that they're not the ones that we're going to go home with a catheter. And we get a lot of calls, a lot of hand holding. We need to offer a lot of support. Let them know that this is just a bump in the road that we'll get them through it, it's not a complication. Um, but lastly, we need to remember that um, early identification is key so that we can protect those kidneys. So that's all I have. Yes, thank you.